Okay guys, um, so this is the second lecture for English 3 Fahrenheit 451. We will be going over the second part, the sieve in the sand. Uh, you should at this point have already done the first section, the hearth and the salamander, uh, and then wrote the journal associated with that. The journal associated with the section this week talks about the same format as before where it has uh, a bare bones question which is who is Faber does he seem trustworthy um, what does he give Montag after their first meeting and what can this be compared to in modern time uh, then the deeper analysis uh, which is 250 words the first one was just 100 words this one's 250 uh, why was it so hard for Mildred and her friends to hear Montag reciting poetry Taking their immediate response into account, what does this say about the society's response to feeling uncomfortable? Uh, briefly discuss the impact that numbing a society has on its people, and what do you think is meant by numbing a society? Now, going into this book, um, it's not about government control or things like that. Um, are there certain aspects of the book that can be perceived that way? Absolutely, but you can look at anything, any way, and get any response from somebody, okay? What this book is really about, and I have no reason to lie to you guys, it's primarily about the negative impact that mass media has on a PC culture. Now, it's very important to note that second part about the PC culture. So... A lot of scholars will say this is strictly about the spread, how dangerous mass media is, but what makes the mass media in this book so dangerous is the fact that it's being fed to a PC culture. Now, what do I mean by PC? That's like politically correct. So even if you recall at the in, in the first section, um, Captain uh, either Beatty or Beatty, I don't care, Captain Beatty, uh, talks about uh, how all this stuff happened, like how we started burning books, and it all came down to people being offended over things. If Now, we can agree that there are some things that are just overtly offensive, no matter what you, like hate speech, you know, like that's a big thing that a lot of people agree with is just bad, but what Captain Beatty was saying is, Eventually, if your society gets to be a certain way, if anybody is offended about anything, it shouldn't be permitted. The fact that it offended you is really important, but the fact that it made you uncomfortable was the biggest um, issue. Nowadays, when somebody is offended, they don't say, I don't like this feeling because it makes me uncomfortable. They say, I'm offended, and that's their feeling, okay? But in this book, they're breaking it down beyond that. They say, after a while, it will just numb out. Everybody will find something offensive about anything. And to prevent that, there's a large number of books, especially like free-thinking books, books that's just me writing what the heck I believe. Uh, is there any merit in that maybe maybe not it's for you to decide on your own okay so um that's how this society came about people getting too offended over things so we started censoring everything not because one group was right and one group was wrong that's the biggest thing he's not saying that we did this because one group was correct and one group wasn't correct it's that if it made you feel uncomfortable at all, it's wrong. It doesn't matter what it was saying, what the message was. And so what this did after several generations of this kind of thing, it teaches you that you shouldn't ever have to feel a certain way if it's negative. But feeling negative, especially offended, it's very important to feel offended because then that solidifies in your own mind how you really feel about a topic. I don't know how to defend what I believe if I'm never challenged on it. If I'm a boxer and I get in the ring and I've never had somebody better than me in the ring beat my butt, how am I gonna get better? 
okay? So we all know that that's important. It's important to have somebody challenge you. You know, it's called playing the devil's advocate, like, oopsies. Like if you were um, feeling a certain way on a topic and I wanted to just test your ability to defend that point, even if I agreed with you, right, I would argue against it just to see what structure you set up to defend yourself, okay? So at the end of this, the first section, let me see if I can get here. Um, at the end of the first section, uh, basically uh, Montag and his wife uh, are reading these books. Well, Montag is trying to read these books, uh, trying to soak up as much information as he can because he knows he's going to have to turn in one of the books tomorrow because the captain knows that he has one and is basically saying, hey, I'll give you a day with it. So basically, in Montag's mind, he's thinking, if I can soak up as much information as I can, um, I won't feel as bad about returning this book to him, okay? So again, guys, when I'm, you guys should have already read this, but I'm going to try to explain it like you haven't, because I know a lot of you haven't. Like, I was, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you, I had this book in high school too, and I read like half of it. But I knew how important the message was, and I knew, and it inspired me. So that's why when I go back to it now as an adult, like an adult, I know that I want to relay what I know to the audience that I know that you are, to me 10 years ago. It's like, how would I, like, I have to understand that you guys aren't going to be reading this every single night, like studying it, like super intently. But if I can inspire you through its message, through my explanation, maybe one day you'll pick it back up or you'll understand and be like, oh, I remember that. So I, I meant to say that when I go through this, I just take notes and I'm going through the story and we're going to, um, I'm going to tell you about it from there. Okay. So, um, Mildred is uh, still kind of in denial about all this business. Um, they're in the parlor room, which is basically just where Mildred spends most of her time, which is just a TV room. Uh, we find out that uh, there is an atomic war or a war happening right now in this society. Um, and apparently um, they've started, America has started and won two atomic wars since 2022. That's two years from now. Um, and then he says, is it because we're so rich and the rest of the world so poor and we just don't care if they are? I've heard rumors the world is starving, but we're well fed. Is it true the world works hard and we play? Is that why we're hated so much? I've heard the rumors about hate once, too, uh, once in a long while over the years. Um, so on the, next put, on the next page, this is Faber talking to him. Uh, remember that Faber is an old individual who he's had kind of contact with here and there until eventually he like tracks him down, Montag tracks Faber down because he knows that he can talk to him about this situation with the books. Um, and he says here, uh, this Faber saying, uh, I don't talk things, sir. I talk the meaning of things. I sit here and know I'm alive. So that's a good... Uh, kind of parallel to what the society is. So in the society, the, uh, when they speak, they're just talking about things, not the meaning of things. Kind of like how earlier in the book it, it described Clarice as asking not how things happened, but why. Um, that's a very simplistic comparison between these characters and the rest of society. And I have here noted that Faber could sense Guy had a free-thinking spirit much like how uh, you and a good friend click. So when you ever, if you ever talk to somebody or kind of come across somebody and you know it's like, okay, I can, I, I can kind of relate to this person, uh, this is the same way. He can see that Montag, because Faber's like an academic, and um, he can see that Montag has this spark in him to wonder why, and so that's why he's being a little bit more open with him, okay? Um, so 
they're 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 asking like how many copies on this next page like like there is a huge scarcity of books um they ask uh how many copies of shakespeare and plato or left montag does and faber's like none dude what are you talking about um so now uh he goes back home um he basically after uh is this let me make sure this is at this point he and Faber are in contact with each other. Let me make sure this is the right spot. Um, yeah, so he meets with Faber to try to convince him to kind of like copy these books or to talk to him about it. Faber's like, no at first, and then Montag just starts, it's the Bible that he has, starts ripping out the pages to get him to pay attention to him. Faber's like, okay, 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 I'll help you. And Montag is like, all right, cool, I didn't mean to do that. You know, I just had to get your attention. And so now Faber, is um oopsies favor gives him kind of a like one of these this is in the 50s he wrote this uh a little headset to put in his ear so they could be it's a bluetooth so they could be in did that exist when um sorry i'm having to do this like all weird did that exist when he wrote this no god no um so it's kind of creepy but he gave him a bluetooth so they can kind of talk to each other um and make sure that they're constantly in contact with one another uh, and then he starts thinking, he goes home, and then he comes to find out that Millie has invited a bunch of her friends over. Millie's doing this to just kind of get her mind off of anything. She, she's, she, she's a drug addict, she's a degenerate, she's a, a shell, she's just a, a nothing. She's a nothing. Um, and Montag starts thinking about the conversation he had with Clarice where he, about love you know, with the dandelion, and he was so upset that this game said that he wasn't in love with anybody, uh, and that really got to him, so he, he asks Millie about the white clown, and the white clown is just like an advertisement, like a TV thing, he goes, Millie, does the white clown love you, and she didn't say anything, and then he said, does your family love you, love you very much, love you with all of their heart and their soul, Millie, uh, he felt her blinking slowly at the back of his neck. Why'd you ask such a silly question like that? Uh, he felt like he wanted to cry, but nothing would happen to his eyes or his mouth. Uh, if you see that dog outside, said Mildred, give him a kick for me. Okay, so this is just an example of comfortably numb. Um, he's asking a very important question. Like, like, do these things that you idolize love you like I want to love you? Like, and she... She's so far gone from being numb in this society that she doesn't get that this is a deep moment. She's like, what the hell is he talking about? She's like, um, he must be feeling weird. Well, if you see that dog outside, give it a kick. That makes me feel better, that type of stuff. Um, so he, at the bottom there, he said, uh, I'm numb. He thought, when did the numbness really begin in my face, in my body? The night I kicked the pill bottle in the dark, like kicking a buried mine. So I have notated here, uh, if the bottle is empty, so are you. And then I crossed out the word if, and I wrote when. So when the bottle is empty, so are you. Um, so then they, um, he, he's on the bus to see Faber, and this is where the sieve in the sand kind of the, the title comes from because he's trying, have you guys ever been like really trying to focus on reading something and you read it and you get like halfway down and you realize you didn't retain any of the information? That's how he is right now. He's trying to read the Bible and he's on like the subway and this advertisement is running in his head for denif or denim's dentrophis. It's like, um, like a toothpaste. So he's trying to read, he's like, um, trying to read this part of the Bible and then it just keeps happening over and over in his head and he's comparing it to when he was a little kid and a bully told him, if y'all know what a sieve is, it's like a little funnel thing with a little hole, big, little hole in the bottom, big one on top and it filters things out and a bully told him that if he can fill it all the way to the top with sand, then like he gets a prize or something, uh, not understanding the physics of when he scooped it up, it, it's going to fall out. So he's saying that he's trying to scoop up all this material in his head and keep it there and retain it, but it's just flowing out okay and i have here written we are so distracted by the luxuries of modern day that we cannot turn the volume down even when we try uh so 
annoyingly catchy and uh, ads play by themselves in your head. Um, you know, this was written in the 50s before this like super mass media was like really, really apparent on TV at least. So um, next page here. Faber is described, uh, and he's at Faber's house. This is actually when Faber gives him the the headset. This is the first time they're kind of talking to each other. I, I skipped ahead of it. Uh, but he's described basically uh, as he's in a little room of machinery and steel tools that were strewn upon a desktop. Basically, he's just kind of described as the Unabomber. Like, he's this academic, but, like, he doesn't involve himself with, like, all this technology and stuff like that. Um, so... This part right here, um, when Montag shows him the Bible, he's like, "Oh, I'm not a, um, I'm not a religion, a, a religious person." He goes, "It's, but it's as good as I remember." Lord, how they've changed it into our parlor these days. This is basically saying how they've dumbed down the image of Jesus Christ or Christianity to be palpable for everybody. And he says, "It's kind, it says that Christ is one of the family now." meaning he's on TV. I often wonder if God recognizes his own son the way we've dressed him up, or is it dressed him down? He's a regular peppermint stick now, all sugar crystal, and when he isn't making veiled references to certain commercial products that every uh, worshiper absolutely need. And right here I have this akin to like ultra mega churches. Um, Faber goes on, um, I'm one of the innocents who could have spoken up and out when no one would listen to the guilty, but I did not speak and thus became guilty myself. He's basically saying when they were coming around and censoring everybody and destroying these books, he didn't say anything, and now he's paying the price. Um, he said books were only one type of receptacle where we stored a lot of things when we were afraid we might forget. There is nothing magical about a book. The magic is only in what the books say and how they are stitched Okay, um, he then goes on to the necessities uh, that we need. Uh, he goes, number one is quality of information. Number two is leisure to digest it. And number three is the right to carry out actions based on what we learn from the interaction of the first two. Um, and then later on he says, all the better. You didn't fancy it up for me or anyone even of yourself. Uh, so basically he's, he's mocking uh, people that get online or like that that put a platform before themselves so I say here say what you mean but make sure Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat can relate to it so it's like we have this society where we like oh man those guys say exactly what they mean on their Snapchat but it's all it's all fake they're all saying these things that like seem really courageous and then the next thing is be sure to like and subscribe like, like it's all an act you know, like, like they like like people that have beefs with one another online. It's supposed to be this real thing, like an, a conflict with somebody else, something we all have, but it's still dressed up to be this fake performance online. And it's all because we are numb. That society is numb as people, right? And then we get online, and that's when we can express who we quote unquote really are. But that's where. Uh, as Ray Bradbury explains it, the danger lies because the moment that anybody has a voice, it's not that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. It's the people that are the loudest get the most attention, okay? And that's when it's dangerous because now we live in a time where you've always had to watch what you say, but now it's ridiculous. Okay, and I wish somebody would challenge me on that. I, I, I want to argue with you guys about this um, because I used to be, because so, it's a good idea, like PC attitude is a good idea, but when you move beyond just simply taking somebody's feelings into account and being an academic and addressing certain issues the way they're supposed to be, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it. Like. Let's just move on. Um, so on page 82, uh, 
he goes on, he goes, Faber raised his eyebrows and looked at Montag as if he were seeing a new man. Uh, he goes, I'm just joking. And he goes, if you thought it would be a plan worth trying, I'd have to take your word. Uh, uh, your word. I, I'm try, I would have to take your word. It would help. He's talking about uh, planting books uh, in firemen's houses and stuff like that. And then he goes, you can't uh, guarantee things like that. After all, when we had all the books we needed, we still insisted on finding the highest cliff to jump off of. So society is always going to destroy itself in a certain way, even when we want, like, even when you have, it's kind of like the, the example of, like, even when you have everything you want, like a rock star or something, you end up shooting heroin and you die. Um, he then talks about Caesar's Praetorian Guard. Oh, so this is, um, I'll explain this really quick. He, he talks about uh, whenever a, a new emperor would come into Rome, uh, they, he would have his guard behind him, whispering in his ear, you know, reminding him that he's only human to kind of uh, get him to recognize that he's a great man, but he's still just a human and he can be overthrown. Okay. Uh, on page 88, he describes an ATM machine in the 50s. Um, Montag walked away from the subway with the money in his pocket. He had visited the bank, which was open all night, every night, with robot tellers in attendance. ATM machine. Um, so now he's back at home, and he, uh, all the girls are there, and he's talking about um, all the women's husbands are in, are in the conflict now because this is an atomic war and stuff like that that's going on. Um, and... They're basically saying, um, Miss Fe like Montag is kind of disgusted. He's like, "How are you not work? Like y'all are just drinking and like having a good time right now." And you're, I'm like, "You don't even know where your husband is." And she's like, "I'm not worried. I'll let Pete do all the worrying. I'll let old Pete do all the worrying." I'm sorry. <laughs> she says that twice. Uh, not me. I'm not worried. And then somebody else says, "It's always someone else's husband that dies." They say, and then she goes on. I've heard that too. I've never known any dead man killed in a war. Killed jumping off buildings, yeah, like Gloria's husband last week. But from wars, no. And then he goes, not from wars, said Miss Miss Phelps. Anyway, Pete and I all, always said, no tears, nothing like that. It's our third marriage each, and we're independent. Be independent, we always said. He said, if I get killed off, you just go right ahead and don't cry, but get married again and don't think of me. Uh, and then I um, talk about, like, this paragraph was written, you know, in the 50s, and it was so over the top like three marriages are you freaking kidding but when you read it now you're kind of like yeah that happens a lot so i wrote here how does this compare to 2020 the idea of marriages this society being numb and then the effect it has on marriages um so right here i have um this Statement by Miss uh, Bowles, who's one of Mildred's friends, is critical to understanding the populace. Uh, they're talking about giving birth, and she says, um, I've had two children by cesarean. Not, no use going through all that agony for a baby. The world must reproduce, you know. The race must go on. Besides, the, besides they sometimes look just like you, and that's kind of nice. Two cesareans turn the trick. Yes, sir. Oh, my doctor says cesareans aren't necessary. You've got the hips for it. Everything's normal, but I insisted. So women in this society are more concerned with their figure or uh, the how uncomfortable childbirth will be. And then they said, you know, this is just a kid. Like, why would I waste my time with just, why would I risk that for a kid? Um, and then right here it says, uh, I plunked the children in school nine out of 10 days, uh, nine out of every 10 days. I put up with them when they come home three days a month. It's not that bad. You leave them in, or you leave them into the parlor, and turn the switch. How many of y'all have little cousins and nephews that just play iPads all day? Um, then they talk about the election and how they voted for a certain president because he was better looking. Uh, and then this is a really important part. Okay, so Montag is getting fed up with this, and. He, he's like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, 
like how do y'all know anything how do y'all know how to feel anything like you're, you're you're completely numb and he's like you know what i'm gonna read you a poem mildred is just like don't do this you know oh he's crazy ha ha and then he reads them a poem uh called the sea of faith and i won't read it out loud to you guys uh, but basically, it causes Miss Phelps to cry. And um, it starts with not being able to control or handle criticism, then emotions uh, as a whole. So this whole lecture is leading up to this moment right here. I'm glad that y'all stuck around. This numbing of criticism from anybody, which led to a list of banned books because people don't like feeling uncomfortable, okay? It led to a total numbing of emotions. Because if I don't have to defend what I feel and what I think is right, I'm just gonna forget about it, okay? And so numbing that criticism then led to numbing emotion. So her response was just the physical form of what she couldn't come up with in her head. Her body, her soul knew that that poem was beautiful and was so relatable to her but she didn't know what to think like have you guys ever been so full of emotions it was like what's the matter it's like I, I don't i don't know like that's how she was feeling but that but that's how she was feeling from a poem you know when that happens to us it's it's usually a big deal like mom dad died um, we got cheated on, we got stabbed, murdered, some cousin got shot up, something like that. That's when we lose ourselves. Like we don't know how to handle it because that type of thing doesn't happen to us. This is her reading a poem and this is happening to her. And this says so much about the society. They are so numb to criticism in the beginning that it beco they become numb to everything. And her response is like, she doesn't know what to say, so her body's just like, oh, God. Like, that's just the way it is. Um, it's kind of like holding back tears your whole life and then finally letting it go and not knowing why. Um, even there, she says, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I don't know. Uh, and then uh, Miss Bowles gets mad. She goes, why do you people want to hurt people? Not enough hurt in the world. You got to tease people with stuff like that. You know, it's the, the criticism thing. It's reverse bullying, if that makes sense. She's saying, because how I feel, because of what you said made me feel negative, you're a bully. Just because you don't agree with somebody doesn't mean they're being a bully. Um, and then Montag says, go home. Go home and think of your first husband divorced and your second husband that killed himself in a jet and your third husband blowing his brains out. Go home and think of the dozen abortions you've had. Go home and think of that and your damn cesarean section too and your children who hate your guts. Go home and think how it all happened and what did you ever do to stop it. Go home before I knock you down and kick you out this door. That's, that's the person in society right now in modern day that's like, I can't take this PC anymore. You guys don't feel anything like that, okay? And then all the people that disagree with multicolored hair turn around and call them bully. Now, don't think that I'm leaning a certain way, left or right, because on the right, and by right, I don't mean republic, I mean conservative, right? So conservative values versus liberal values. Both of those extremes scream like three-year-old children, so they're the loudest. Those, those ends of the spectrum, right, those ends of the spectrum are the loudest, and they're the smallest part of the population, okay? But, they're, but they scream the loudest, and that's, and that's who he's screaming at, these people that are numb to criticism, numb to emotion because of the numbness to criticism. So I said being offended slash criticized is a good thing. It teaches you how to fight and respond. But people don't ever want to be uncomfortable, even if it will benefit them. So I have notated here, uh, beautiful words do not always equal truth. Uh, and that is when um, Beatty is talking to um, 
Montag. Montag comes back, gives him the book. Beatty kind of knows what's going on. Um, and Beatty actually is an academic kind of his, himself. He he talks about all these beautiful language pieces and talks about how they're just empty words. He he recites these beautiful pieces of literature and then he equates it to just because it's a beautiful word doesn't mean that it's true. Um, so Faber's in his ear the whole time. He was really kind of peed off that uh, Montag did that in the house. Uh, he Montag goes back to the fire station, turns in the book. They're playing poker. Montag is kind of losing his mind. And then they get a house call. And they uh, speed down the road. Uh, they slam on the brakes. Beatty looks over at Montag. Was like, what's up, dude? What's the matter? Montag looks up. And it's his house that they got to burn down. And that's the end. So uh, not, that's the end of the second chapter. Uh, I'm going to post the responses now. Um, if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Uh, we'll be doing this every week. We got one more section to go. All right.